Good. So we'll start the broadcast now. Okay, so we're going live, are we? Okay, welcome everyone um, to this Cornwall Flow Accelerator webinar. Um, I'll just give it a couple more seconds to make sure that uh, people are actually joining the event. Oh, see the participant numbers going up, so I just give that time to reach a, a healthy number. Hope you're all well today. It's another lovely sunny day in some parts of uh, the UK. Okay, let's make a start. So welcome everyone to this Cornwall Flow Accelerator um, webinar on flooding offshore wind materials and manufacturability. So I'm Simon Cheeseman from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult and I'll be the facilitator for um, both this morning's session and this afternoon's session. So if we have a look. <clears throat> so these sessions are being recorded. We will, we will make the slides available after the events, probably locate them on the, um, the Celtic Sea Cluster um, website. There, is, there will be an opportunity after each of the um, presentation sessions for a short uh, Q&A, um, and that's if time allows. Uh, otherwise, we'll have a longer Q&A session at the end of the morning and then another one at the end of this afternoon. Um, Zoom's got a polling feature, so we will be asking um, some survey questions on, on what you've taken from the, um, the various presentations. Um, we've got Vicky Sharp from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult working behind the scenes managing Zoom. So if there's any questions there, just put them to her. And Julie Taylor, um, part of the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, who's, who's set up and managed this, um, this event, will be keeping an eye on the delegate questions that are raised in the chat. So we've got a very, um, <laughs> very um, um, involved game of two halves here. So we've got a session, first session this morning covering um, offshore wind turbine blades and then the towers running from now until 12 o'clock. And then this afternoon, uh, a follow on link session um, looking at foundations, anchoring and mooring. And this webinar series um, is the first of a series of uh, industry engagement events where we're looking at um, highlighting the size and scope of floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. We're using this sort of blades to anchors approach to consider innovation challenges. Uh, and what we want to do is try and bring the industry up to a shared level of understanding regarding the state of art design and manufacturing of offshore wind turbines and also understand the opportunities for decarbonisation in floating offshore wind, with the, the overall objective of um, encouraging the supply chain to become involved in, floating, in, in offshore floating wind. Now, what we're trying to do is encourage you to consider these various topics and um, either through the survey or getting directly back in touch, I want you to identify those areas where you're interested in a deeper dive workshop, um, which we're hoping can be in person um, to explore these subjects in more detail. Now, the presentations that you'll see, um, most of them are based on um, some intense literature review and analysis of the research and development work that the Catapult's been doing um, on floating offshore wind. So these are quite technical presentations. So um, that's why I think it's important that we do say these presentations will be provided um, to you after the event. So what is the Cornwall Flow Accelerator? Uh, it's a, a European funded project. Uh, it's part way through, it's running out till June, 2023. And it's about trying to accelerate deployment of floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. By doing some of that necessary groundwork, 
to help identify what the project pipeline may look like, trying to look at some of the challenges um, around deploying um, uh, floating offshore wind systems. The project's actually led by Celtic Sea Power, who are part of Cornwall Council, or owned by Cornwall Council. They were formerly Wave Hub Development Services, and they're supported by the Universities of Exeter and the University of Plymouth and then the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Together in collaboration, the key things that they'll be doing as part of Cornwall Flow Accelerator, as part of the project is deploying a floating LIDAR, or two floating LIDARs rather, to collect wind resource data uh, from the Chaotic Sea. Um, and some of that data will be made available. So if that's something you're interested in, you need to get in contact with us at the, uh, at the project. They have already designed a numerical simulator model, um, which will then be linked to a university um, motor vessel simulator. And this is to study the logistics of offshore operations. So it's looking at the sort of 500 megawatts plus array um, and looking at sort of um, logistical pinch points and looking at impact on um, levelized cost of energy. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a whole range of research-led um, investigative work looking at low carbon manufacturer floating offshore wind technology. And that's really where this particular webinar today comes in. So this is giving you um, insight into what we've looked at to date and the sort of initial conclusions we're drawing. And this is where we want to engage with um, businesses to um, take some of these ideas forward and look at what can be manufactured locally and where can we drive out um, sort of um, carbon intensity from manufacturing processes. So this is the, the, the start of the journey to start, start to build up some of those um, sustainable partnerships um, working with us in this project. So where does the Cornwall Flow Accelerator fit in? Um, so within the overall Caltic Sea um, piece, you've got the Caltic Sea cluster that's been set up to um, address the market, to make sure that the, um, the market conditions are right, that you've got the support from the Trans States, that you've got the support from Bays. Um, and then um, the, the, the cluster links with the Caltic Sea Developers Alliance. The Developers Alliance represents all those developers that have got an interest or, or put a stake into um, the Caltic Sea. And then, we're, as I said, we're closely aligned with the Crown Estates who are working away looking at an accelerated um, leasing um, process so that we can achieve the ambitions of four gigawatts of floating offshore wind by sort of 2035. So the Celtic, Celtic Flow Accelerator is a project that um, is managed, as I say, by Celtic Sea Power. Celtic Sea Power are part of the cluster, they're on the cluster board, along with the catapult and Cornwall Isles of Silly Lep. And so they fit into that Cornwall Celtic Sea cluster piece that fits in with the other major stakeholders that are trying to accelerate floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. So here's a killer slide for you. This is one where you want to take a screenshot or you will get the slides afterwards. Um, this is trying to put the whole of floating offshore wind into concept in one slide. I'll just let you um, dwell on that for a minute. So the table down the bottom uh, represents the sort of um, chart above where you can see uh, the total forecast um, for uh, UK floating offshore wind by 2050 is 50 gigawatts. This is total UK. Um, now, I think this is this is probably quite pessimistic because I think in the Celtic Sea, we know there's around about at least 150 gigawatts of resource. Um, and part of the work that the cluster is doing at the moment is trying to consider what that likely vision is for the total um, extracted energy that we want to have by 2040 and subsequently by 2050. Globally. We expect by 2050 there to be about 240 gigawatts of deployed um, floating offshore wind. <clears throat> and you can see below that the cumulative um, GVA 
um, domestically in the UK and what we think will be um, viable from exports as well. And then that translated into jobs. So it gives you a, an idea of the size of the price. I, I, I still think this tends to wear on being slightly pessimistic, um, although there are issues that may, although we have the ambition, um, may sort of curtail our, our ability to develop out um, floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea. Issues around port infrastructure, issues around grid infrastructure, issues around um, sufficient offshore vessels with heavy lift capability, large floating cranes. So this is why it's so important for um, us within the Cornwall Flow Accelerator project to engage with the supply chain to start to address some of these issues. <coughs> Excuse me. So first survey question. Um, and Vicky, if you've got the survey questions ready to pop up on Zoom. So it's quite straightforward. Um, were you aware of the Cornwall Flow Accelerator project before you, you, know, you heard of this webinar? So just a simple yes or no. Small vote as well. There we are. Okay, good. Hopefully you've, you've had time to um, answer that. We can't dwell on these too long because we've got to um, get along to the main body of the questionnaire today. Okay, so here are the results. So actually a healthy 73% of the audience um, were aware of CFA, which is good, um, but it's still worth uh, mentioning it to the other 20% who were. So hopefully this is starting to <coughs> whet your appetite to learn more about CFA. Um, we won't be able to answer all the questions today, um, but please make a note of our contact details that um, Julie Taylor will put in the chat um, for myself and uh, Julie put her detail, her email details in there as well, so that we can follow up on any questions. Okay, good. So um, this morning's agenda. Uh, time check, see where we are. Right, okay, good. Um, so first it's me. Um, just giving you an outline of today's proceedings. Um, and then I'm followed by Mark Forrest, who's our Blades Research Lead. Um, Mark's going to talk about um, uh, 122 meter blades on a 15 um, megawatt turbine and look at some of the issues around design and manufacture there. So very pertinent, very right up to the minute sort of discussion. Um, that'll be followed by, and I'm sorry, after Mark's session, we'll have another um, poll, another chance for questions and answers um, if, if we've got time. Uh, then Dylan will follow. Dylan Duncan, who's our mechanical research engineer, will talk about um, turbine towers, uh, different construction materials, different types of tower design, some of the um, physical engineering challenges they're in. <coughs> And then there'll be another chance for uh, questions and answers, uh, then a, a poll question. And then straight after that, we're really pleased to have um, Guy Raymond from RWE join us. Um, Guy's Floating Wind Knowledge Manager at RWE. Um, and Guy's going to give you an industry perspective in terms of what does one gigawatt look like and what's RWE's approach to um, supply chain and some of the issues there. So um, super interesting presentation expected uh, from Guy. We've then got an opportunity um, before lunch for a final round of questions on anything that we've heard, anything about CFA, anything about Celtic Sea Cluster um, in that sort of all speakers session um, then. And I'll just give you a, a hint of what's coming this afternoon. Um, there'll be a recap by me of the um, objectives from today and what we've learned so far. Um, I'll give you some more information on um, pipeline for both Celtic Sea and what we expect to happen in Scotland as well. Um, then Dylan Duncan's back on. Uh, he's talking this time around foundations and sort of current development around foundations and where we think they will go in the future. Some stuff on materials. And then we'll have a um, a chance to have some questions and answers, another poll question. And then Ellen Jump, our, uh, one of our project engineers from the Catapult, will talk about anchoring and mooring. 
and talk about, um, again, size and scope of anchors, where do we think they're going to go, the latest state of the art for materials and um, where that might go in the future. And then we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Ollie Stobb from uh, BW Ideal join us. Ollie's their business development manager in Northern Europe. Um, <clears throat> he's going to talk about um, concrete hull fabrication and looking at local content and local employment um, there. And again, a chance for question and answers um, with Ollie. And then we round off the whole day um, with a final opportunity for um, discussion, discussion about what you've heard, discussion about how to get involved, discussion about more about the cluster and, and events pertinent to, um, to the Chaotic Sea. Okay, so without further ado, and I'm just going to check to see what's in the chat, then I'll hand over to Mark. Okay, Julie's put up our contact details. Great, thanks very much, Julie. Okay, Mark, um, over to you. Thanks very much, Simon. I'll just share my screen now. Yep. Can everyone see that okay? Uh, yep, it's come up, Mark, that's all fine. Fantastic. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, as Simon's um, already suggested, I'll be talking about future blades manufacturing um, and some of the um, pertinent issues um, that we're facing. Um, to do that, I'll just come across some agenda points here. Firstly, I'd like just to touch upon blade design and manufacturing, given the general nature of the audience. I don't because of the timeliness of the, of the talk, won't go into too much detail there. Uh, I'd spend a, a bit more time in talking about a new reference blade design that was developed um, as part of the project, touch upon some cost and sustainability issues. And then the majority of the talk, I'd like to, to really focus on the future blade manufacturing variants, which we'll be doing as part of Flow. So in terms of the task one objectives, as some has already pointed out, we're looking at um, the state of the art and what's possible really in blade manufacturing in the context of a future um, turbine. And that's a, a, a slightly larger turbine that's, that's currently given the numbers uh, available in the market so far. That's a, a 15 megawatt blade, um, a 15 megawatt turbine with a 122 meter blade. And as part of this study, um, we're looking to bait using this to, to be baseline um, blade and then using that baseline, which consists of um, the cost model and, and carbon intensity to, to look against a number of different process variations to look at um, how blade manufacturing could change given the circumstances we want to achieve around sustainability and cost reduction in general. So very briefly, um, obviously resin infusion remains the dominant mainstay of um, blade manufacture. Um, and usually it's around a 16 step process as um, illustrated in the panel on the right, basically consisting of, of two half shells um, to produce skins in, which are typically carbon and glass fiber uh, composite, often with a, an epoxy or a vinyl ester based matrix being infused. Um, that shell basically after curing, um, has the placement of webs. The, the entire construction is then closed in the assembly um, for adhesive bonding of the two half shells. Um, and then following a number of um, operations is then demolded and then surface prepared and finished. So it's very important to, to set this common understanding of what um, we see as this, this common baseline approach. Um, so we get an accurate metrics of cost, energy and materials use behind it. Um, and once we do that, we can generate some, some really accurate CO2 equivalents um, footprint outputs. Um, to do this, we've adapted the NREL detailed blade cost model. Uh, and as alluded to previously, um, this baseline is, is then used um, for the assessment of the deltas in both costs and CO2 for the variants we'd like to study. So the baseline blade design, um, we decided originally very early on in the piece to use the um, newly released at the time, um, IEA 15 megawatt reference turbine as a baseline. 
however, during the, the course of the study, we found that basically um, this is, isn't a structurally viable blade, um, which came as a bit, bit of a shock, but a, a great opportunity. Um, so basically we'd have to add too much material to make it aeroelastically stable. Um, which means you have very um, an unrealistic assessment of how much mass um, of materials you required to make this blade. And for these reasons, um, we developed a new baseline blade based on, on this um, geometry with some tweaks. And I'd like to go into how we went about making those tweaks now. In terms of the blade design, um, we used a, a piece of software which was co-developed between um, RE Catapult and Bristol University as part of the Windblade Research Hub. And this software package is called Atom. So basically it's a simultaneous optimizer or holistic wind turbine optimization tool, we like to call it. Um, and the whole point of this is, is to really seek a minimum in the levelized cost of energy produced from a particular design. So if you see on the panel on the right there, um, there's a number of constraints that Atom enforces in, in order to do this. Um, so basically, generally speaking, um, lower mass designs always tend to, to show this, not always, but the majority of the time, um, to, to make sure across the entire design paradigm that all of those constraints are met. Um, new features are being added to this software, for instance, a tower optimization, which includes the effect of um, both composite or steel towers um, have been made. Um, and that's an ongoing process of further development. And the important thing uh, in terms of Atom is that its output um, is, is compatible for, for more detailed load analysis under the industry um, popular um, piece of software called Bladed. So in terms of the original baseline design, uh, as mentioned, um, it didn't, it produced a, a massive blade that was, was far too high. So as part of this work, um, two variants were optimized in Atom. One, which is a, a frozen loads optimized result, which is the green line you'll see here. Uh, and the other is an error structural optimization where both the structure and the geometry are uh, are optimized simultaneously and that's the blue line. So just to explain the figure at the bottom here, um, this number one it is basically a, a failure index. So basically what we seek to, to do here is to keep the outputs of the loads under that line. So you're making the, making the most efficient use of the material put in the blade. Um, so for reference, the baseline, which is the original 15 megawatt IEA um, blade is shown in in the orange trace. So the solid orange trace um, refers to those um, loads where you have failure um, uh, of the fiber itself. And the dashed line is showing um, failures um, between fibers in, in, the, in the material. Uh, and the output of this, the, the, that's the blue line, uh, the aerostructural, full aerostructural optimization as seen to be mass competitive when taken against um, scaling up trends of current, you know, 100 meter plus blades. Um, this is a bit of a highlight piece of results, um, full results. Um, and this is courtesy to our, our, our structural lead on this, which is Peter Greaves. Um, he'll be presenting uh, along with Sam Scott, um, who was a, a PhD student at, um, at Bristol um, at the June event in, at Talk 2022 in Delft. In terms of the, the mass breakdown, um, this 122 meter blade came out to 69.5 tonne. Um, and that's in line, as I said, with upscaling of current blades. And as you can see there from the pie chart, that the majority of this material is basically taken up with um, glass, both in terms of the unidirectional and biaxial material used to um, create this design and about a quart, uh, less than less than a fifth, sorry, as as carbon in in the main structural spars. In terms of the cost of that particular model, um, we came using this ad adapted NREL blade cost model we used at around seven hundred and ninety um, k USD. And again, you can see the the most of the cost is. is um, really dominated by the material cost. And then after that, um, the most expensive being 
labour. And this is for, a, a, as I said, just to reiterate, a, a resin infused, um, manually placed um, fibre and infused structure. So just touching upon sustainability uh, for a moment, um, you can see on, in the figure in the top left, in terms of um, composite waste is produced by, by sector in thousands of tonnes, you can see wind is, is right up there, quite sizable with, with a number of different industries. Um, and just like Simon, I'd like to mirror um, a similar graph, which, which mirrors the content Simon showed already about the cumulative capacity and, and you can see there that um, baseline at the start is 2020, that figure starts at. And you can see basically two orders of magnitude increase up to 2050 uh, means an awful lot of blade is going to be produced, but this is for, for decommissioned blades. So basically you can see from a worldwide perspective, um, this is not UK data, but this is, is global. The amount of, of, of blades coming off the market um, being decommissioned. Um, so bl blades, for instance, that were um, turbines that were um, put up in the 90s uh, are now becoming the end of their life. And we're seeing a rapid un uptake in the amount of um, blades that will need to be disposed of. So that along with other um, potentially regulatory um, drivers, particularly around um, uh, landfill usage, uh, makes it pertinent that uh, a solution for more uh, sustainable solutions in terms of wind blade manufacture be found. So it's quite an urgent need. Uh, in terms of the, the life cycle analysis we did, um, the, the report which will be um, produced in a few days um, will outline the methodology we used. Um, but basically, the idea was to, to set a baseline for that um, resin infused blade um, it was done both in terms of a output in terms of a single blade and then scale to a one and a half gigawatt wind farm. Now I'd like to touch upon some of the, the variants um, that we'd like to, to study as part of um, the, the flow project. Not a, they're not the sum total of all the variants we'll look at. Um, certainly it's a great opportunity once we've got this baseline established to, to look at a number of variants. And so, um, if anyone in the audience have a particular technological bent which you feel that would 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 suit the case, we're more than happy to to look at um, that in particular. But I've just chosen four just to give a a flavour of, of the kind of innovations and and directions we see that um, technology going. The first one um, is a variant we called uh, additively manufactured core. So you can see in the top right figure um, foam. Uh, or, or not necessarily foam, but usually it's um, a cellular foam plastic is used to stiffen the um, composite skins between the leading edge at the front here, which is marked, um, the, the structural spar cap in the middle and between the end of the structural spar cap and the trailing edge. So these um, uh, panels actually placed to increase the localized um, stiffening response of, of the blade so you don't get buckling failures. And, and the tricky, obviously, is to, to size those, um, both the strength and the thickness of these uh, foam cores um, to just make them the, the minimum possible mass addition to a blade while maintaining those, those loads. So conventionally, these cores are made by uh, slab stock foam materials, and they're often cut and scored because they're rigid materials. So they have to be cut and curved to basically allow conformance to a, a compound curvature, um, as you can appreciate in the figure, um, an aerodynamic blade shape that's, that's changing through the Z axis or, or through the page um, it is a complex surface. And in order to get intimate mating with that, these curves are necessary. In addition, these core kits, which come pre-assembled from the manufacturer, um, are quite a value-added good um, already because uh, in addition to those, those curves for, for um, conformance to a mould, um, they also need to be drilled. So it allows a, a path for um, volatiles, air and, and liquid resin to flow as part of the resin fusion um, manufacturing process. So it has a number of distinct um, disadvantages, which we see can be overcome by using additive manufacturing. 
And so the idea is to produce these, these cores using um, locally um, manufactured uh, cores by way of additive manufacture. You can see in this next panel, some, uh, an idealized structure in the top right there uh, of an internal structure of a foam core. So you can see um, the benefits for mass optimizations for potential mass reductions are very quite high. And the idea is just like a core kit, um, these, these would be pre-shaped um, tiles, which would be easily um, manually placed in the mold, which so it's an approach which is certainly um, uh, highly compatible with, with the way foam core kits are currently placed in the mold. Um, but the idea being in, because they'd be, um, have flat, smooth as produced surfaces, um, they'd, they'd suffer from less resin uptake, which is a, uh, a common, current issue with um, today's blades. That um, the, the uh, voids which are created at cut interfaces on foam um, take quite a lot of, of um, resin up as, as our work has shown already. Um, so we'd, we'd look to also make that fit quite um, uh, highly toleranced. So there'd be a, a snap interference to, to minimize the amount of, of resin which is taken up even at the, the joints. Um, but it also allows opportunity to control the, um, locally control the flow of, of resin infusion and, and minimize the time of, of resin infusion over current um, resin infusion techniques, because you've got a very fine amount of lateral and transverse flow according to where you put um, through channels, which can be closed. Um, so it allows also opportunities like tailored featuring, like um, uh, for instance, uh, lightning receptors that, that need to be buried in structure or um, it, it, basically any, any structural um, features as well that need to be impinged upon those, those foam cores and break out um, between the skins that can also be designed into the, into the structure. Uh, the second variant I'd like to, to touch upon is segmentation. Now, um, conventionally, um, we like to call um, resin infusion is, is, is mold centric. So it's very series based and it suffers from very low mold utilization. Um, that is the, the amount of time which is spent to do the primary function of that tool, which is the molding process, number, number three on the panel on the, on the left here. Um, you can appreciate that the, the steps taken for, for the dry fiber preforming to, to build up the structures prior to infusion is, 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 takes quite a long time. And then the mold itself is used as the assembly step to place the um, vertical um, shear webs in, which is in panel number four. And then those two shells are then closed and then cured to cure off the adhesive, um, which adjoins those two half shells um, before final demolding. So it's not a very um, efficient way to use a piece of tooling. So instead by segmentation where we're, um, simultaneously manufacturing a number of different blade segments, um, which uh, one or two manufacturers currently do now in, in terms of split blades in, into two, um, we propose a very cell-centric manufacturing process where um, depending on the geometry and the, and, the, and the mass of material that needs to be placed in the mold, there are other um, manufacturing processes um, which are better suited um, to those smaller segments. Um, so it really allows us to optimize the, the, the cost and minimize the time in, in manufacture to achieve some good outcomes. And this is a result of a lot of, as an illustration, this was initial optimization that we looked at, at uh, looking at automated fiber placement on a, on a small scale. Um, so this is really uh, to allow, as, as I've said, uh, automated manufacturing routes, which, which currently aren't mass competitive, um, uh, which aren't cost competitive um, under a conventional view. There's there's been illustrations before where conventional um, approaches to automation on a large scale have been taken, and the capex is, is far too large. So this looks to to looking at at smaller um, blade sections, which are possible to be um, um, use these automated methods to to achieve, and as we can see between zero and, and three segments, there's a, a local minimum um, in the cost over a conventional um, single blade or, or single mold um, 
um, approach. And the advantages of this are, are quite um, far reaching in that um, you can imagine if, if you have smaller segments, for instance, to produce, you can have a reduced factory output, a footprint, which obviously is a huge CapEx reduction, um, which could probably offset our CapEx um, requirement to, to um, use a lot of automated methods. Um, and it gives the flexibility of manufacturing because you can imagine there could be some ports, for instance, where you'd um, want the majority of the blade um, to be produced under a conventional mold, for instance. But if you have a segmented blade, um, you could either um, continue to, to manufacture at a local site or, or further afield within the country where those smaller segments are, are more easily road um, transportable. And, and that's a, a large uh, cost burden um, to transport. But if you can reduce the size of them, um, it, it allows interoperability as well. So um, it means that designs can be, um, uh, the longevity of designs can be, can be greater. So you can actually use tools um, uh, a blade, for instance, with um, from the root to the the first segment tip, which is um, quite common, and then have the the tip section, which can be tuned or, or different to according to different design drivers, can be used, but have sharing a common um, root section, for instance. The third one um, that we'd like to look at is one on using reusable consumables. The resin infusion process actually produces quite a lot of, of waste for the nylon vacuum foils, which are used um, to a lot of um, ply releases and tacky tape and, and so forth. Um, it's quite a wasteful um, technique. Um, so in this one, we're looking at using um, silicone elastomeric bagging film, where the, the molding can be done right against the, the bagging film itself. And we found basically um, so basically, you, you'd, you'd pr produce the, the blade using this um, uh, this foil, if you like, this this elastomeric um, bag. It'll be removed um, and between mouldings, and that would basically be um, a continued process. So you basically have um, no step where you'd have to the deep bagging of the the um, the blade won't be as as involved and then the main thing that we've done already in this study is to to show that approximately you'd only need about 30 parts so you, the the bag wouldn't have to be used too long before it became um, economically viable there's other things we need to add in there particularly in terms of of lifting solutions and to study um, the added extra on cost to that which would put the number of parts to break even a, a bit higher than 30 um, but it's an area we, we think has has legs and is a, as a quick um, uh, relatively low risk um, for for implementation The fourth variant I'd like to touch upon is, is thermoplastic and alternative blade reinforcements. Um, again, using Atom uh, as part of the study, we'd like to look at um, compared to the conventional um, glass and hybrid, you know, glass carbon um, designs, we'd look at, like to look at a different material and use them where, they're, where they'd be best placed in the blade structure. Um, there's a number of different thermoplastically um, produced um, materials now, um, as long as fibres such as basalt, um, natural fibres such as flax, for instance, as well. And again, we put this, this, um, these variants through the um, cost modelling and, and really seek to, to see what effect on a large scale um, the reduction in, in CO2 would be. As an example here, um, um, thermoplastics, for instance, um, long been touted for a, a, a step change in, in um, that, that can potentially lead to longer, lighter weight blades. Um, the lower cost part is, is a bit challenging at the moment, it must be admitted. Um, but the real advantage of thermoplastics is basically they eliminate the need for heating, heated tooling. So currently using thermosets, um, these blades have to be um, heated to, to ensure full cure in the in the resin to achieve their maximum mechanical properties. 
obviously this comes at a cost. So these other materials don't require, have such a requirement for, for to be heated. Um, so obviously there's an equipment and a process time reduction um, as a result of using uh, thermoplastics. Um, but the on cost, in, particularly in terms of blade recyclability, um, a lot of systems can be recycled um, quite well. The repairability um, has been shown, uh, but also secondary therm, uh, thermoformability. So it, it leads options to other forming processes which can be used in, in blade manufacture. And recent example of that, which I'm sure many people on the call would have heard about, um, Archemia has a system, uh, an acrylate based system called um, Elium. Um, and one such OEM, LM um, in particular, has an a, a ongoing project here um, in demonstration of, of a large scale blade using this resin. So, yeah, I've, and see that I've just come over time. Sorry, Simon and all. Um, but yeah, that probably rounds out what I'd like to um, discuss here and only to, to touch upon um, basically the future opportunities will be exploring those and, and other variants in the manufacturing. Um, we'll have further consideration for more accurate factory layouts. Um, so particularly in terms of sizing and, and which, for instance, port authorities would be um, really best suited um, to, to take advantage of some of these variants. Um, and we'll further in investigate the cost potential uh, of a number of others. And, and finally, yeah, we'd like to review the impact of localised manufacture and identify key opportunities for the Cornwall area. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, there's a couple of questions um, come through for you. Before we do that, I just want to do the survey question on blades. Um, <clears throat> Vicky, if you can, if you can put that up. Because that that lines with uh, what Mark's been talking about: blade segmentation, additive manufacture, course, thermoplastic. So, if if you're interested in this sort of thing, there was a question about: Are we trying to stimulate local content and interest um, through blade segmentation in developing blades in the future? The answer is yes, um, but we've got to try and you know see what that sort of feedback is. Who is who is interested in doing this? Um, so. <laughs> I'll just fill this in. Um, there we go. And then just give you a couple of minutes to, um, I mean, Mark, that was a great presentation. Loads and loads of detail in, detail in there. So uh, I expect people are still trying to absorb some of that. <laughs> I, I may have skipped over a few bits, but uh, I didn't want to um, tell people how to suck eggs either. So That's okay. So there we That's go. That's okay. That's okay. Vicky, are you are you able to show the um, poll result results? There we go. Um, so yeah, quite a bit of interest in blade segmentation there, um, and also alternative renewable materials. So great. Um, any of that, if 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 you're the person responding to that, then um, if you can send in your details in an email say that you know, you've, you're interested in this particular aspect or if there's a couple of aspects that you're interested in, what we're trying to do is, is group you together and we can plan the follow-on sort of deep dive exercise and start to influence the next piece of follow-on work. Um, so that's great. Thanks for that. Um, Mark, so um, questions that have come in so far. Um, do you believe that there's any place for downwind turbines in floating offshore wind and how would this design affect the blade design? And if yes, there, there certainly is. Um, the, the, obviously you can make a lot uh, more flexible blades because it removes, uh, as you may remember the panel I showed you in um, Atom, um, you can remove some of the tower constraints. So it means um, the excursions of, of the blade, you, you don't have to worry about tower strike. Um, so you don't have to make the blades as, as stiff, so therefore you can remove material, have fle more flexible blades. Um, it is certainly possible, but because um, they'd be transferring, um, traversing a, a longer displacement um, in their, their, their use case, I think um, the criticality really comes down to fatigue, which drives their design. Um, so it means um, probably more use of, of carbon um, thermosets. One of the, the drawbacks 
of thermoplastics, although static strengths have been achieved in thermoplastic-based um, materials, um, their downfall, I, I won't necessarily, as a, as a general rule of thermoplastic fatigue performance, um, thermoplastically-based composites fatigue performance um, isn't usually as good. Um, so that becomes the limiting factor, if you like, in, in, in using materials, um, using thermoplastic-based elements. There's ways around it in sort of um, um, sizing moieties, which are used on, on the fibre surfaces to interact and, and produce very good, strong bonds in the material, um, have to be developed and not just developed, but characterised very, very well. Um, so that their design allowables can be reduced. And it's re having better knowledge of thermoplastic fatigue and, and driving those um, design tolerances down means that blades can be designed lighter. Um, but, but certainly um, downwind turbines are, are of great interest um, um, for those, those reasons. Um, it, it's just whether the, the, we can effectively drive the materials hard enough to get a good advantage out of it. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, very quickly, I'll do two more questions and then we'll have to jump to the next presenter. Um, can Atom be used to design an additive manufacture blade using thermoplastic and uh, I think that means continuous fibre? Yeah, effectively they can. They put in... Um, Atom six to, to put in the reinforcement where it's needed and, and the stiffness driver. So um, the local thickness, um, I believe, can, can be changed off the foam. Yes. Okay, brilliant. And then the last question for you at this moment, we can always come back at the end of the, uh, the morning session. Uh, two part, well, two, two questions here, a bit naughty, sneak them in like that, but that's fine. <laughs> Are there any design implications of using a recyclable epoxy resin? And the second question, are there concerns about blade strength if you join multiple sections rather than casting a, a single blade element? Yes, good questions. Um, mm -hmm. The first one, no. Um, as long as it can be shown those strength and fatigue strengths of the composites that they produce um, are, are adequate, then I don't see why not um, in, in terms of the recycled epoxy. Um, and, and that's the biggest driver to know the material well. We can. The more we know a particular material and get, get really good um, um, material property data um, that's validated, that's the thing that takes down the design allowables. Um, and sorry, the, the second question was, oh, the segmentation, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The, that's the issue with segmentation is um, ideally you'd like to look at um, solutions that are co-cured or adhesive bound, bonded solutions for segmentation, um, which give the lowest mass. Um, the, the drawback is how to find effective, um, particularly if they're mechanical joints, how to effectively um, affect them and have really good designs um, produced because they do add weight to the tr traditional bolted techniques tend to add mass to the blade. Um, but you could argue on the other side, if, if you're in, it allows you to build longer blades and you can offset the LEP if uh, the the AEP, which is annualized energy production, then then basically it's a, a mass, it's useful mass worth having um, to get that extra AEP by extending the blade. So yeah, there's caveats to it, but um, generally yes, it's harder to enact blades that are, are mechanically bound. Is the short answer. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks very much, um, Mark. Um, we're going to have to move on now and um, want to talk about um, uh, towers and uh, like to invite um, Dylan Duncan to um, share his slides now. Mark, stay with us. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions for you um, when we get to the sort of uh, the end of the morning session, the overall questions and answer piece. Yep. Thank you. Dylan, are you there? Yeah. Hey, hey, Simon, I'm here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen now. Yeah. There we go. Uh, can everyone see and hear that? Okay. Uh, not the moment. No. Oh. It's out there somewhere. Ah, I forgot to click the one button that will do it. There, there we, we go. go. There we go. Well, that's perfect. Thanks very <laughs> much. Uh, or is yours? So, 
Hi everyone, and uh, thank you, Mark, for that really interesting presentation as well. Uh, so my name is Dylan Duncan. I'm a research engineer here at Worry Catapult. Today I'll be covering our kind of side of the project on the tower, which is similar to that that Mark just spoke about. And we're looking at the kind of new technologies, new opportunities for potentially reducing the carbon footprint for wind turbine towers. So just as an agenda, we'll be covering, I'll be looking at what the baseline design is for a wind turbine tower. We'll be looking at what the it, what else is it out there in the industry. We'll be looking at potential improvements that can be made there and looking at future technology opportunities. So this will be quite a high level overview of what's in the industry right now, basically. Uh, I think the wind turbine towers are quite a, it's a component that's classically like established, we have a, a, an industry baseline and a lot of companies stick to that. So I think it's quite interesting to look at what the alternatives are to that classical baseline. So in terms of our project outline, I think because we're all doing this as part of the Cornwall Flow Accelerator, you'll be seeing a lot of slides on what we're doing as part of this project today. But effectively what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the opportunities out there uh, that are out there for reducing the carbon footprint for wind turbine towers. And I'm doing this in two separate steps. So the first is to carry out a literature review to highlight the trends in industry and academia and seeing what we can do, what potentially work can be done out there for achieving that. Once that's been accomplished, we'll define our reference turbine and we'll start engaging the local supply chains in industry. And from there, we'll be able to establish kind of facility requirements and so on. And after that, if you look at the kind of below uh, flow chart, we'll be able to start to define our kind of overall life cycle assessment and we'll be able to compare that to what is the industry standard and see how much of an impact our potential solution can make. So just as a quick problem statement, so naturally our towers are incredibly large structures and heavy structures, generally always made of steel. Uh, if you look at the graph on the right, I uh, apologize, the co color coding isn't the best there, but the power structure itself takes up about 9% of all the embedded carbon in offshore wind turbines. Uh, blades make up the, the bulk of that, but 9% is still a pretty significant chunk. The graph on the left highlights the kind of breakdown of where those emissions come from. And about 82% from a standard tubular tower comes from manufacturing. So as you can imagine, if we can figure out ways to reduce that, either by using different materials, different manufacturing processes, a different structure, we'll be able to bring that percentage down. And I think the positives of kind of looking at how we design these turbines is that if we, re if we make the manufacturing more efficient, and generally speaking, other aspects such as transportation uh, and the actual dismantling and decommissioning of towers makes that a lot easier as well. So there's a good knock-on effect there, I think. So just to kind of go over some of the initial requirements for what a tower needs to do. So for a lot, for the people that are attending today that already know quite a bit about wind turbine towers, I'm sorry. <laughs> but essentially, to a wind turbine tower is a much more complicated structure than you might think it is. Uh, you need to meet a high, it's quite a heavily designed structure. It needs to be able to meet multiple ISO standards and structural requirements. So for example, ensuring that it can meet ultimate strength design cases. You need to design it with fatigue and stability in mind. So there's different certifications and standards out there that explain how to do that. You need to make sure it can take the highest amount of loads it can, and it can do that for a long amount of time. And there's even more delicate things like natural frequencies that you need to take into account as well. And of course, with offshore wind, those problems become almost, well, they, they're increased quite substantially. So those loads will be higher than they would on onshore. And the environmental conditions are naturally a lot rougher as well. So you're, temp you're designing it for a wide range of temperatures. Minus 30 to 50 is a standard, but if you're working in, say, the Arctic, you know, that will become more extreme. Lightning protection, icy conditions, and of course, you're designing it 
to withstand a lot of waves and water contact as well. So there's a lot there that you need to consider when you're developing these standards or these towers. So now that we know what it takes to build a tower, we'll start off by looking at what is the current industry baseline. I probably don't need to tell anyone about this, but generally speaking, almost all towers that are constructed within the industry just use typical steel tubular conical structures. So the idea is you, your bottom diameter is wider and then it gradually will decrease as it gets closer to the top. And that's optimized in a way to minimize how much material you're using throughout the tower. For larger towers, you would separate them into segments, typically 20 to 30 meters long, and you would attach each of those segments via flanges and bolts. So that makes for easier transportation. To give you an idea of masses, I believe that's for a 15 megawatt turbine at the bottom there. And you're looking at 860 tons for just the tower mass alone. So it's a huge component. In terms of manufacturing as well, you're looking at various rolling processes as well. And I'll speak a bit more later on in this presentation. So to just briefly look at steel, why do we use steel? Well, for the, it's the material that we have the strongest amount of industrial knowledge in. But something I found interesting as part of this project from looking at LCE information is the type of steel and the manufacturing process that are, processes that are used for steel actually plays a significant role in the impact uh, from the CO2 emissions produced. So if you look at the table on the bottom, you can see that low alloy steel produces about 1.45 kilograms of CO2 per equivalent. Whereas when we look at your secondary steel, this medium work hot rolled steel, it produces over three. So how you make the steel, how you, the steel you're using plays a huge role in your overall emissions as well. So what are the actual alternatives today for what kind of steel we use? The classic one is concrete. So generally speaking, steel and concrete are really the only two materials that have been generally considered in the industry. The graph on the top right actually shows a kind of fragility analysis comparison between concrete and steel. And it, this analysis in this paper pointed out that concrete actually performed that steel. Additionally, when you look at the figure on the picture on the bottom right, which is of a segmented concrete tower, some designs like that highlight the kind of almost ease of manufacture and the ease of installation over potentially a steel structure that might be more complicated and require more fittings involved. The downside with a concrete structure though, is that if you look at the table on the bottom left is the masses. So there it's volume compared to mass of steel, but the mass of the concrete would make the overall tower structure a lot heavier than that of steel. And in the context of floating winds, you want to keep your overall turbine light naturally for when you're designing your floating platform. Big advantage to are those costing numbers. So at 80 meters, a steel tower costs just over 150 grand. Concrete is just under 60. So you're almost a third of the cost effectively for a concrete tower. So there's advantages and disadvantages to this. So perhaps a, a wilder potential, more sustainable material choices would. Uh, it's been used kind of experimentally uh, on offshore turbines. There's a company, so this image comes from a company called Modvion, I believe they're Swedish. Uh, they have a couple of kind of turbines in Germany and Sweden, and they're aiming for their structures to be commercially, or, commercially produced there. Their wooden towers will be commercially produced this year, actually. I'm not sure what the kind of progress is or how many megawatts they're looking at, but there is a sustainable alternative to start stealing concrete out there. I feel like it's probably too soft a material to be used in an offshore environment, but I think it's an interesting alternative. So outside of our classic tubular 
structures, what else do we have? So your classic examples are your lattice turbine, which is effectively rather than having one solid tubular structure, you've instead got lots of kind of struts that are connected to each other, typically via bolts or wells. And you can also get more interesting. So if you look at the image on the top and at the far right, you can see a hybrid tower. So they might use a, a lattice structure and then either a tubular steel or a concrete structure to fill in the rest. And you can kind of get the best of both worlds almost out of these structures. The graphs at the bottom show the biggest advantage that a lattice structure would have over a tubular structure. And that's the reduced amount of materials you're using. It's a far lighter structure than a tubular structure. And as a result, you lose a lot of emissions caused by manufacturing there. And that's kind of what the graph on the bottom right shows. The obvious downside though is that when you've got say a lattice structure or one of these hybrid structures, the connections are a lot more vulnerable. So rather than having two solid segments fixed to each other, you've got lots of individual struts that are all bolted or welded. And there's a lot more that can go wrong there as well. So in an offshore environment, it's debatable, even though it initially might look good in terms of numbers, your chances of actual failure are higher. So it's whether or not you can kind of balance that out. And this is an extension of the table I showed earlier comparing steel and concrete, only this time there's a hybrid turbine that's using a kind of half steel, half concrete structure. Overall, it would be heavier than steel and lighter than the concrete, but the costs arrive in the middle. So I'd really like to see the kind of performance numbers in terms of an LCA analysis to see what the actual impact of those kind of structures are. I think that highlights some really big advantages uh, that hybrid structures have over steel and concrete. Uh, so in terms of future technology, Mark kind of alluded to this earlier in his presentation that there is a bit of an appetite out there to look into composite towers. If you look at the table on the bottom left, the mass of these composite towers, which are the ones labeled as T1 and T2, were significantly lighter than the steel towers massively lighter. And if you can imagine you're designing, say, a floating platform, that would be really advantageous to have a far lighter tower, because it means you can simplify your design for that. Uh, the graph on the bottom, on the top left, showed the kind of emissions produced by different sizes and types of turbines as well. So initially, composites are quite high or massively highly emitting. But over time, because of, presumably because of easier maintenance, the fact that they'll last a bit longer as well. It almost evens out over time. I'm slightly skeptical myself as to these figures, but I found it interesting regardless. And I would definitely be intrigued to see further research on that matter. On the right hand side are two images that I've taken of patents. I believe these are both from GE patents. So they're looking at the top right one shows a kind of plug and socket design where rather than using like lots of individual bolts or flanges to connect the towers together, they've effectively used these kind of plugs that connect like that. Simplifies manufacturing and might potentially improve things like transportation as well. The one on the bottom right shows these kind of tapered edge design. So rather than rolling like a purely conical shape, you'll roll it in a way that it has this flap and then you can just bolt around it. Interesting designs and I think the fact that these are patented designs by a major company like GE shows that there is appetite within the industry to perhaps better refine these tower designs. So in terms of manufacturing, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but generally speaking, conical towers are made using rolling processes to make each subsection. For concrete, you would use molds and templates, and it has an advantage of being slightly more efficient. From a UK perspective, I think we've got quite a, a negative reputation, I'd say, for manufacturing, generally speaking, a lot of what we get from imports. But there is growing interest, uh, and I, th I have a slide at the end that I think adds a slightly more optimistic viewpoint in terms of manufacturing. This is a bit of a high level overview in terms of what we can do to make improvements. So if we decide, well, actually the concrete towers make the structure too heavy, 
or the composites are too expensive or too complex. And we just want to, we think that the steel tubular structure is still the best. How can we still reduce those emissions? So these are two figures taken from various papers on how to further reduce these emissions. So the one on the left was in a paper where they suggested a kind of pathway of reducing CO2 emissions in the steel and iron industry. And it's effectively by slowly integrating specific kind of higher to then lower TRL methods. So for example, integrating CCS, more often biofuels than hydrogen, we can potentially reduce the amount of CO2 per steel by almost 80 to 90%, depending on whether you're using ore base or scrap based steel. The graph on the right shows some findings on how we can reduce emissions produced by concrete. So the biggest emitter in making concrete is cement. There's a lot of uh, the process in making cement can be quite intensive from a carbon emission standpoint. And generally speaking, some there are quite a few papers out there that point out that by changing some of the constituent components within your cement, when you make your concrete, your emissions can be reduced. Uh, admittedly, I'm not an expert when it comes to concrete or cement, but I found it interesting uh, to know that depending on what you're using to make these products, you can reduce your, your emissions quite significantly. So earlier I mentioned that the UK doesn't have the best foundations for manufacturing, but uh, late last year, the Global Energy Group announced that they're constructing a 110 million pound offshore tubular rolling facility in the port of Nig in Scotland. This is quite a huge thing. There's a lot of companies involved like SSE, for example, as well. Admittedly, the port of Nig is all the way in the Highlands. So in terms of Cornwall, we can't really get much further away without leaving the country. But I think a huge project like this that's involved governments and major companies at least shows that there is a real interest within the country to start looking into improving our manufacturing background here. So just to quickly wrap up, we've looked at what the current state of the art is for a modern day wind turbine power. We've looked at alternatives for structures and materials. We've looked at some core differences between those materials and structures. We've examined some quick future technologies. And we've also looked at the kind of core manufacturing processes. And just before I end and go back to Simon again, I've got all the references down for all the papers and figures here. So when you get the slides afterwards, you can look at those individually and get the more technical info out of them. Thank you. Hope you've enjoyed Smashing. it. Th thanks very much, Dylan. That's absolutely uh, amazing. <laughs> um, just, a, just a couple of questions. In, in terms of the sort of alternative structures and, you know, lattice structures and things like that, and some of the other ones that you, you showed, some of the, the sort of very, uh, very things, are they realistic options or just sort of examples of, of what else is around? Yeah, a mixture, kind of a mixture of all above, to be honest. So there aren't really any examples of those being applied in offshore wind, which is kind of what I'm most curious about. Uh, someone did point out to me that there was one or two more experimental towers in the industry, but off the top of my head, I cannot remember for life of me what the name of the manufacturer was, but I'll dig that out again. Uh, but I would be really interested in seeing what the numbers would be, like more, more research into that matter, actually, because as I said, we would simplify almost the manufacture of the whole turbine and that would help the foundations and the anchoring side of things as well for yeah. able to improve that as well so there's that not yeah. effect as well but right now it is a bit of a pipe dream and most of those designs have only been used onshore rather than offshore. yeah and i suppose that was going to be my follow-on question you know are, are they going to have the strength um to to resist the sort of environmental pounding that they're going to get out in the celtic sea for example yeah, so that's the that's the real challenge there. And it's something we've spoken about in other projects where we've been defining tower designs and things like that, where on paper, when you're going purely emissions, lattice seems like a like a real win. It's so much lighter, uses far less materials. But the obvious downside is there's so much more components, it requires more maintenance, and it's more likely to fail. And if it does fail, then those CO2 
emissions that you saved are now you've lost them now and now you're using more co2 to yeah. build a new one. yeah yeah so i do think it that would lend itself to some r d opportunities even just yeah. to confirm these things but I think I mean, it's something I mean, we've got to think about how we get the technicians up to the uh, the nacelle as well, haven't we? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just to, just on one of the points you made about there being a bit of a, a sort of negative reaction to tower construction mm. in the UK. Do you know off the top of your head, you know, the sort of maximum s s thickness of steel that we can roll in the UK and where we'd need to jump to to be more viable? And is some of the problem at the cost of rolling steel in the UK? So off the top of my head, I, I don't have those figures, but those are figures I'm looking to generate in the next half of this project. So right, that's okay. something I'm quite keen on researching on. Uh, the reason why I mentioned there was a bit of a negative reaction was based on a meeting I had with an under industry partner literally last week where they were like, the UK has no background whatsoever in manufacturing this. He was very adamant on that. And for the most part, he is correct. But I think that little example I showed from that Port of Nick project shows that there is kind of an increased demand or interest there. Yeah. So I do think it will improve or it should improve, hopefully. Uh, unfortunately, that port I showed is absolutely hundreds of miles away from where Cornwall is. But hopefully there'll be appetite in the future to build something for ourselves. OK. A um, couple of questions that have come in from you, one from Martin Jewell. Is anyone building a tower using a self-climbing robot that can actually lay the, the, the actual material? I mm. mean, I know we've looked before at sort of uh, self-assembly um, mm. towers and the cells, um, but I suppose that's using preformed um, sections mm. like that. Uh, I've not seen anything, but that would be really interesting to see, actually. Uh, I'll keep an eye out. Uh, robotics wasn't something I really considered when I was doing this project, so that'd be an interesting opportunity just to look into. Uh, okay, yeah, so if Martin, if you've got anything specific on that, then then drop us a line. Um, something from Frank, uh, any interest in development details on the tower to facilitate self-climbing lifting systems? Similar sort of question, really, mm -hmm. um, for installation and O&M. Yeah, so this was something I briefly considered as I was looking into this project. We did consider the kind of safety system side of things. Given our focus was on reducing the reducing of the carbon footprint, we decided to kind of take a back seat on that. So I've not taken any particular thought there, but that would be a natural next step for the project. And we're defining our reference structure. Yeah. Um, Mark, you've got your hand up. You've got a question. Um, yeah, I was just going to add, I'm, I'm aware of two groups that have looked at concepts at looking at um, doing self-assembling self systems and, and nacelle, um, self-erecting towers, effectively, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so those, those posing questions and saying happy to have a call, please send us your email details so we can get in touch with you. Okay, um, just want to go on to the survey question for this, um, Vicky, if you've got that there. It's quite straightforward. Are you, are you interested in a collaborative R&D project on solutions for um, anything other than typical steel conical towers? Um, a straight yes or no. Probably be better to have a bit of a multiple choice, actually, to, uh, to widen it up. But yeah, if you could uh, give us an indication of your interest in looking at alternative solutions. Thought the wooden one was quite interesting. Mm. Bamboo to that. <laughs> um, but what, what about, um, you know, mixture of concrete and steel? You know, if, if we can't the right thickness of steel, could we have a hybrid solution sort of thing? Yeah, I think that would be, that's, that, that would be a solution that I in particular would be very interested in looking at. So having that kind of, that combination of, concrete which is slightly better for for the kind of environmental side of things but then the steel kind of keeps that weight slightly reduced as well <clears throat> i think there's interesting stuff there potentially yeah brilliant okay um good response of people who are interested in looking at uh, other types of design so do drop us a line so we know exactly who you are that, that'd be fantastic okay thanks very much dylan that was really good a lot of positive comments there um, we move across now to our industry speaker, um, to Guy Raymond. Guy, are you there? There you are. I can see you now. 
Yeah, brilliant. Would you like to uh, start sharing your slides? Tell us a bit about the uh, the RWE perspective of life. Sure. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yeah, I can see your slides. I can hear you perfectly. I can see my screen. Thanks very much, Guy. Sorry, you can see my screen. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Guy Raymond. I work for RWE Renewables. Uh, and I work in the central floating wind development team. So my role is uh, spread across the, the global portfolio and, and our team is in place to really help enable uh, RWE to transition into, into floating wind. Um, and I'm here today yet to talk about a, a, a developer's perspective, but that said, we are a, a developer and operator of offshore wind farms. Um, so yeah, not quite the details of the last few slide decks, but um, hopefully an interesting overview for yourselves. Um, content, <clears throat> quick look at our demonstration projects. So we have a portfolio of three floating wind demonstration projects at various scales of uh, or stages of development. Um, uh, as Simon said, a quick deep dive into kind of what does one gigawatt of floating wind look like? So from a project infrastructure perspective, um, breaking down into key key pieces of that, that infrastructure. Um, our view or maybe you know more of, of my team's personal view of the, the current challenges we're facing and, and i think with those challenges uh that, that we're facing in, in floating we are presented with a number of new opportunities and hopefully there's some some supply chain members today who can who can respond and um and we can start to collaborate with uh, i don't think we could have this session without talking a bit about ports and the major challenges that that we're facing with ports as they are uh, key to unlocking the floating wind industry and, um, and finally, kind of rounding off from all of that, just to give you an overview of our general approach with the supply chain. So yeah, so if anybody doesn't know us, um, I just wanna hide this, this bit up here. Can everybody see this black menu? Can I, can I remove this? Stop sharing, no, there we go, okay. Um, so we're a global renewables player, uh, diversified portfolio, um, operating over wind, um, onshore and offshore solar and storage but so 25 percent of our 9.4 gigawatt portfolio is in is in offshore um but that's actually pro rata down so a number of our, of our operational projects and development projects are within consortiums so we do actually own and operate um 19 offshore wind farms globally uh, with our biggest biggest market in the us mainly in onshore but a significant offshore portfolio in in the uk then from a floating perspective um, the global portfolio is looking at just over 20 projects at this stage, um, spread across nine countries with a total potential install capacity of over 20 gigawatts. So um, we're expecting to compete in at least six competitive processes over the next two years. Um, happy to, to kind of advise that our, our key markets at this stage are, are France, so Brittany South this year, which will be the first CFD floating wind Project Auction, um, of course, the Celtic Sea. Um, we are the, the world's biggest renewables um, generator and operator um, in, in Wales. Uh, also Norway, Japan, and both both east and west coast of America as our as our key markets. And um, and through that, you know, we're really able to start leveraging the the benefits across the portfolio uh, to improve our knowledge and um, and to and to commercialise floating wind faster so look at our demonstrators and um my background here today is actually uh, a picture of the tetrasark spa project which was deployed last summer um so that's what a 3.6 megawatt turbine um it was assembled in in grenna uh, in denmark and it was uh, towed up to norway where it's now operating so it's a, a steesdale um steel tuber design it's got quite a unique um counterweight suspended suspended keel which gives it its stability uh, and, a, and a catenary mooring system so that's operating well now um, and has been for the last for the last six months second demonstrator is with SciTech, so that's the demo technology and it's a two megawatt project currently under construction in bilbao and is, um, is set for deployment this summer so it's a twin barge hull with a, a single point mooring system and uh, and as I said, it's a, a concrete concrete design. And then finally, working with the UMaine University in the US um, and Maine Aquaventus, we have an 11 megawatt unit, which is um, currently in development, so in design, another concrete component 
um, and uses a kind of a, <clears throat> the glue joints technique that, that is used in, um, in bridge building. So across our portfolio of demonstrators, you know, we're working with both steel and concrete, um, three different types of, of design. So barge, semi-sub and the suspended keel weights. Um, working in the Atlantic, the North, North Sea and the, the Gulf of Maine, working with both standards, so catenary and the single point mooring systems, and partnering with, with startups and engineering companies, universities and oil and gas majors. Um, so as you can see, RWE at this stage is not um, kind of putting, well, we are, we are technology neutral when it comes to, to foundation, uh, floating foundation design selection. I don't suspect that will change either. Um, so yeah, so having a, a bit of a deep dive into, into project infrastructure, I think the, the picture to the left here is, is always one that um, kind of stuck with me. So it's the, a picture of one of the Kim Kardin um, foundations on a Boscalis vessel um, pre-construction. So, so that vessel is 160 metres long, uh, the, the vessel is 46 metres wide, and, and this, this structure is, a, is a, for a 9.5 megawatt turbine, so I suspect slightly smaller than what we'll need for, for the full-scale commercial projects, but just so you can see the, the scale of the operations that, that we're working with. So in the, in the table, the next couple of pages, we've just got some, um, some numbers on what a one gigawatt and a, a 400 megawatt project in the Celtic Sea from an infrastructure perspective might look like. Um, and we are you know, we're currently expecting the first leasing round next year from the Crown Estate for between three and four hundred megawatts, and then hopefully later on a, a one gigawatt, gigawatt um, leasing round. And yeah, so from a turbine perspective, fifteen megawatts is what we're currently modelling for for our global projects, um, global development projects. So that's sixty six turbines for the for the gig or the twenty seven for uh, for the four hundred megawatts. And of course, that already brings its own challenges with a, with a very, very kind of competitive and strong turbine uh, supply chain and, and very firm fixed offshore wind portfolio, portfolios and pipelines um, growing around the world. From the blades perspective, obviously a bit of discussion this morning about blades, but um, 160 meters long, um, 198 of those for that one gigawatt project. And there's some pictures hit up here on the right just showing the scale and especially during the manufacturing phase of the, you know, the Wurzman there. Um, really, really big kit, big stuff. Tower sections, the tower photo here is from the Tetra Spa demonstration projects. So they're not actually full scale. Uh, they're not the same size um, steel towers that you're certainly seeing here from the Kim Kandine um, principal power um, foundation. But again, you know, some serious stuff. And then from a substructure perspective, we expect the full commercial floating foundations or substructures um, to be at least 100 meters in diameter and weighing between three and 4,000 tons, whether in steel or concrete. Flipping down into um, the moorings. So despite you know, operating multiple um, offshore wind farms and, and having full operational teams around the world, new mooring systems in floating wind also gives us an, a lot of new systems to consider. Um, and it's not necessarily the actual infrastructure that's complicated, but from, from an, an installation and operations perspective, you know, new challenges for our operational teams. So looking at mooring lines, you know, it's going to be a mixture of synthetic rope, chains and wires. And with each of those, those lines, individual connectors and tensioners, um, so you can see the numbers there, you know, the, a 400 megawatt project. The, I think the base case here is around a... Uh, 75 to 100 meter uh, water depth in the Celtic Sea, but you know nearly 70 kilometers of, of mooring lines. And again, th there's a huge procurement exercise there. But also, once we manage to procure the, these these items, even the onshore storage, you know, all of that chain that needs to come in and be inspected, laid out at quayside uh, prior to construction, prior to installation, is a huge undertaking. And then moorings. Again, and, until we know more about the, the geotechnical conditions of any, any project, um, we're unable, unable to, to confirm <clears throat> more uh, anchor, anchor types, but they're still you know, huge objects, you know, 20 tons each on average, and there's one per mooring line. So again, you know, both onshore on storage, offshore installation, new systems and new challenges for us. And then finally, um, cables, you know, subsea cables, Anything fixed to the seabed is, is well understood, um, but floating 
Shifting wind brings new demands and requirements for dynamic cables. So those cables that are designed to, to operate um, and, and uphold and withstand the forces and the motions of the, of the sea. And with that also comes a whole new array of uh, both handling techniques, um, you know, failure risks, failure rates, and also accessories. So um, <clears throat> for instance, buoyancy devices, uh, bend stiffness, you can see the numbers here. Um, it's, it's again, operations, installation, and general procurement of, of these items, which yes, dynamic cables have some history in the oil and gas world, but um, not quite at the scale that we're gonna need them for floating wind. Um, so even, you know, supplier selection, procurement um, of these, these accessories is, uh, is still a, a very big task. And, and also, yeah, I mean, this is the infrastructure requirements, but of course, within the development, construction and operational phase, there's still a huge amount of other services, products um, and requirements that we have from, from the consenting, the EIA. I think stakeholder management and communications is a, it's a particularly big one for us in floating at this stage where you know, we're really working with the government, with the Crown of State for, for increased support and, and policy clarity. Um, of course, all the onshore and the offshore engineering. Simon previously mentioned the, the need for craneage and heavy lift uh, infrastructure and the limitations that we're currently seeing on, on, on that kit, as well as vessels, insurance, procurement, um, a huge amount of work that goes into these projects um, that, that we need help with. So with that, I think, what we're looking at here is, is much faster commercialization of floating. Um, of course, there is a, an array of existing equipment uh, that we can use and we will, that we understand well from towers to, to export cables to, to turbines at this stage because no turbine supply has any plans um, at this point to develop any dedicated floating wind turbines. Um, we will see distinct differences in control um, algorithms and control of turbines, but, um, but, but there should be no wild uh, differences in the, the actual turbines themselves. Um, but apart from th that, you know, the, the novel technology that we're now facing, um, faster com commercialization is bringing new opportunities for us um, and for the supply chain. Um, but from left to right here, just some, some challenges, some issues, some topics, you know, none of these are hurdles that we don't feel are, are, can be overcome. Um, but just to, to highlight the, the technical aspects, you know, we're really struggling with the lack of standardization to be able to, to develop projects and, and, and formulate our bids, um, that, that lack of uncertainty, um, more onshore activity. So doing much more onshore, doing much more quayside and the infrastructure that we need. And I can come on to some of those requirements from the, the port slide. Um, new manufacturing and, and installation methods. So for the, the current timelines for deployment and for project construction that we need to achieve the LCOE that, that is expected of us. So, you know, people are talking about getting close to parity of, of offshore fix by, by 2030s. Well, <clears throat> all this onshore work or the manufacturing, the, the turbine integration, uh, it takes a lot longer than it does in, in offshore fixed. So, um, so the throughput that we're expecting is, is, is probably one, one floating, uh, substructure to be manufactured and ready for turbine integration per week, which at this stage is, is hugely ambitious, but that's the, that's the reference point for us. Of course, working in much deeper water um, and having the, the, impact of the impacts of, the, and of motions, so both on yield. We're doing an awful lot of work, you know, with industry and with, with um, academic partners on, on how we think these motions will in, and the, the increased accelerations will impact the turbine at the top of that tower, um, which has a huge impact, of course, on revenues and our project uh, project valuations, but also the impact of these motions on, on the failure rates, you know, on, on human accessibility and whether um, and, and, and O and M. So whether we can tow these devices back to back to shore, um, we're seeing new technology which which is designed to be able to carry out major component exchange offshore, but it's of course well in its infancy phases. Um, and with this, bringing new capabilities, bringing new skills and bringing new jobs, but at the same time, the existing supply chain, and especially in and around the region of the Celtic Sea, um, you know, there's, there's a level of, of education that they need and experience they need to be able to ramp up and, and to meet the, meet the requirements that offshore wind and offshore floating wind uh, has. 
So then commercially, with all of this, uh, the novel technology, the, the, the uncertainty, we are facing many new complex interfaces. So I think it's a move away from the model that we have in offshore fixed wind, where you, you tend to lean towards EPCIs. And our work with EPCI contracting in the floating space currently is looking too expensive. Um, so going back to more of a kind of a multi-contracting strategy where the, the balance of risk between suppliers um, is, is, is not well understood. And we don't, we're still working with the supply chain to understand how much risk they're willing to take. Um, of course, Siemens or Vestas, who's going to sell you a, a fixed offshore wind turbine has, has a very good understanding of how that's going to operate on a fixed uh, tower piled to the seabed, but, uh, but not so much on a, on a floating structure at this stage. So I mentioned the cost uncertainty in, in the development space. This is a real challenge for us. So trying to bid on a, a project like um, Brittany South, the auction for 250 megawatts that we're expecting um, in kind of late Q3, early Q4 this year, trying to reach a, a decision for valuation with no reference points for, for lots of this infrastructure um, and for a, for a project that will go for invi in, uh, investment decision in five years time on a supply chain that doesn't particularly exist, um, it's, it's hugely challenging. And with that, of course, is the challenge all around LCOE. I think there's, there's, very, there's high, very, very high expectations on, on, on the cost of, of offshore floating wind of what it should be. Um, and then you also have the pressure of local content, uh, something that we're working very hard on. And we're very grateful of people like the, um, the Celtic Sea Cluster to, to be able to coordinate and facilitate these, these sessions and, um, and bring some of the, the local supply chain together. Uh, um, but of course, you know, cheap uh, or, or low price, low LCOE has a tension with, with, with local content, with new supply chains. Um, and I've spoken about the balance of kind of, of risk and cost, but it's also reliability. Um, a key commercial topic with us is trying to work with insurance providers and, and brokers to, to really understand how we can maximize our cover at this stage. Um, we are aware of you know, quite a few claims in the demonstration, floating demonstration portfolio, um, portfolio globally, we're being told, uh, none on our Tetra Spa or construction projects so far, glad to report. Um, <clears throat> but there's a process there of working with the brokers to educate them, you know, technically on, on the issues and the, um, the risks. And then similarly for kind of bankability uh, and what does the investor, the investor landscape look like? How much risk are investors willing to take um, on, on, on projects with facing the uncertainty that, that, that we have now? There's been obviously topics around and discussion around sustainability today, but whether it's through development, construction or operations, you know, we have a real duty to minimize our impact to the environment, um, improve security of local jobs, um, working with higher educational and, and, and um, you know, university institutions to, to collaborate um, and, and develop the workforce that we need, as well as, as with the supply chain. And then talking about recyclability, and um, I can share a link actually in the chat with those, anybody who's not, not aware of our work with Siemens. So we're working with Siemens um, to test and demonstrate their first fully recyclable turbine, sorry, uh, turbine blade. Um, on our project in, in Germany, which is the Kazkazi project. Um, so, so yeah, recyclability and the reuse of all of our infrastructure and, and structures, all a growing metric that we're seeing in, in global auctions um, when, when auction bids and auction rules are being, being released. So I mentioned ports and how I can really avoid the, the topic of them being a, a key building block um, to, to the, the commercialization of, of floating wind. Um, technically, the challenges we're facing and, and, and ports are facing, you know, th this rapid throughput that I mentioned for fabrication and for assembly and, and turbine integration, uh, the space that's needed, the infrastructure that's needed. And through that, we have new port parameters, you know, and, and new um, with reference to, to offshore fixed. So it's a much greater keyside space, but also much greater keyside strengths. So if you think about turbine integration, you know, we're now uh, installing towers onto substructures from the quayside and then 
also turbines onto the top of the towers, again, from the quayside. Um, distance to site is, is becoming much more important. We have great distances to tow these, these devices and, um, and also to store them. So, so again, to achieve the, the kind of the project commissioning rates that we need, you know, we'll need to be integrating these turbines rapidly. So once they're, they're manufactured, we generally need to be favoring uh, localities that are relatively well sheltered um, for storage of, of, of substructures. Um, so met ocean conditions are becoming more important and also in within port, you know, again, going back to that complex interface issue, you know, Siemens are, um, are going to be all, all the best, so any turbine supplier um, are going to be very, you know, they, they need to know that the, the detailed requirements of, of, of the integration of their, their technology uh, within within hours, um, and that will play a big impact on our commercial and contractual obligations and responsibilities, and um, you know guarantees, um, power curve guarantees, reliability guarantees, um, lots more to think about. And then a, a, the the, the multi port strategy, which I know is something that um, which a number of institutions are working hard on, um, but ports do need to be working together. Um, People like Celtic Sea Power are working very hard to provide that independent view um, and, and to help coordinate and collaborate, certainly the ports in, in the Celtic Sea. Um, I think there's good lessons from Germany. If you look at the German Bight, where's, whether it's Cuxhaven, Cooksport, Bremerhaven, each of those ports are playing to their own strengths and they, are, um, they take control of specific elements of, of projects um, and it works very well in a very joined up manner. Um, and in the interim, you know, to, for, for the first leasing round of the Celtic Sea, we are expecting um, a number of temporary solutions to be needed within ports offshore um, and onshore to meet the throughput that we need. <clears throat> um, and then moving on to some of the commercial elements, which maybe this should be number one of this slide. You know, the infrastructure investment now needed in ports um, is huge, and it's actually no longer one that a developer like ourselves can can really provide. We can't give the ports a certainty um, for the investment they need to make. We need the policy from government to support us um, in, in project development in floating wind um, and, and the ports need certainty of our pipeline. Um, so now working with the ports, I think it's our, our attack has to be on how we can, how we can provide long-term contracts, um, how we can work concurrently with other projects, other developers um, and you know, keep working with government to, to support them uh, and give them the information they need with the Crown Estate uh, and, and likewise, likewise the, same, the same with ports. Um, availability of vessels and equipment and skills. So with the, you know, the global competition that we're facing, um, <clears throat> the availability of vessels uh, is, is always going to be a challenge. The availability of infrastructure, you know, some analysis we did last year looking at a 15 megawatt turbine there's only two uh cranes available on the global market that could that could carry out the work that we need for turbine integration in that key side um so that has a huge knock-on effect uh, if you have a project in taiwan or korea or or in the us and and you know and, and the crane that you need is sitting in is sitting in in europe um so a lot more earlier engagement with the suppliers to to try and understand their timelines, their mobilizations, the mobilization costs, all has a really big impact. Um, and also working with them, you know, I th people that's, I think in the chat were talking about um, some, some tower climbing or some, um, yeah, some tower climbing cranes for, or infrastructure for, for tower manufacturing. But, you know, we're starting to see now the, the, the proposed tower climbing cranes to carry out major component exchange, and that would be done potentially offshore. Um, but working with those to, with those technology providers to again to dictate our our requirements. Am I short on time, Simon? Uh, you're getting there, guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's just round up then. So from 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 all of those slides and, and that background, I guess our supply chain approach really has four stages at this at this this time. So, you know, we see floating as an evolution, not a revolution. You know, we have a very firm starting base with our with our existing offshore portfolio. Um, I put a point here on lessons learned. I think we can start to do better than that, that standardized um, or kind of accepted 50% local content achievement that's been achieved in, in fixed. Um, 
and I've mentioned government intervention, lots of the consultations we do with uh, with different clusters and, and, and different government advisory boards, but also the, the early supply chain engagement. So defining our requirements before we get to the supply chain. Um, and we have a number of internal knowledge gap programs where we're looking at commercial technology and development topics to really understand what our gaps are in floating wind so we can very clearly and coherently uh, communicate those to, to the supply chain. R&D investment and learning by doing, so that's exactly what we're doing with the demonstration projects across those different partners and different technologies. And then finally, um, industry collaboration. So half of that's about what we're doing today, but also other groups that we're, we're members of. So whether it's the Celtic Sea Developers Alliance or the Carbon, the Carbon Trust uh, GIAP and also the, the Catapult you know, Centre of Excellence in Floating Wind, where us developers are working together to try and solve those industry level problems um, together with other industry groups and, and people like the Celtic Sea Cluster. So happy to take any questions. I think I'm just within time there, Simon. Yeah, thanks very much, Guy. Um, <clears throat> really great presentation. Um, obviously, lots of um, uh, questions there. Um, and if I, if I can just start off, you, you mentioned a lack of standardization right at the outset. And I wasn't sure if that was related to sort of manufacture compatibility or just um, supply chain sort of uh, standardization in terms of the way they operate. Can you, can you just clarify that one? Yeah, I think it's probably all, all of those three that you mentioned. But I guess I guess that slide particularly I was thinking about the component level. So we have lots of new lots of new technologies coming through um and lots of lots of supply chain um solutions but but none of none are particularly standard standardized yeah you know, so, so your concern is about the integration risk and yeah. risk of over engineering i suppose yeah but but also you know there's over kind of 80 global substructure suppliers and designers so so that you know there's a clear lack of of, of uh standardization there as well okay um, just a one that we've been sort of um, mulling over. Do, do you feel as a as a project developer, there's a need for some sort of test platform out there where you can look at the impact of motions, where you can look at accessibility issues, where you can look at, you know, O and M issues and things like that. Um, I think there probably is. I think the problem that we have is kind of funding them. But at the same time, that's kind of what de our demonstration projects are doing, you know, and, and yeah. other demonstration projects. And I mean, Equinor have released some data around their, their operations. Um, it is starting to come through. OK, um, you, you said that, you know, the, 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 the sort of local supply chain doesn't exist um, and, and local content was it was a problem. Um, I think I think you then talked your way out of it by saying that you know you you, you were grateful for the the uh, Celtic Sea Cluster and doing that sort of introductions to the local um, supply chain. Now, I, th I think you know uh, down in the southwest we can show you quite a vibrant supply chain that can turn yep. its hand to most things, and so that's an offer there. And, and we discussed last week about setting up a, a visit for you down to the southwest to come and meet um some of the the, the 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 supply chain players down here um and also there's always that at the back of your mind that trade-off between the cost of energy and doing things cheaper because you're using a lot of overseas um businesses and things versus there will be a price to pay for local content because it's going to be a bit higher and so yeah. what government prepared is government prepared to see a bit of a um you know a, a markup on, on cost of energy for, for having local content because they're driving local content through the sector deal yeah i, I would agree I, I would agree but then i think i think this year's Brittany south auction that first cfd auction in, for 250 megawatts in in northern france will be very interesting because you'll see the the price that some of these made you know the major oil and gas majors are, are willing to pay for, for yeah, power yeah. that's why it really set that baseline so it'd be very interesting but but you know the, the french rules around local government are particularly stringent as well as their recyclability i think 97 percent of your infrastructure has to be recyclable on on that project so hence why as, as you know local content sustainability are, are key aspects that we're seeing on, on our global auction rules yeah and then towards the end you talked about um certainty around ports um and and you were looking for you know, it was something that you couldn't provide as RWE yeah. um, in terms of pipeline certainty. And you were looking for some sort of 
reassurance or confidence from the government. Can you just, you know, dig into that a little bit? Deeper? What what is it you you want government to do? What signals do you want them to to post? I think it just has to be about volume, and I think I, you know, on the LCE point, you know, we ne- we know that we need volume to get the price down. But you know, two hundred fifty megawatts in northern in. In, in northern France next year is not going to, we know it's not going to make a huge difference on the LCOE from a kind of an economies of scale perspective. So it has to be, it has to be scale. Um, it doesn't have to be scale immediately, but we have to have that that long-term pipeline. You mentioned, you know, up to 150 megawatts in a so gigawatts in a in in the Celtic Sea. And I think that certainly the, the ports need a lot more than the four gig that's been kind of yeah, sure shut down so it's, it's really it's what's after that you know four gig is great and it's great for for most of the supply chain including the ports but what what those ports in south wales need is, is what's after that yeah so that's that's part of the work that i'm, I'm doing with the chaotic sea cluster as part yeah. of you know, the regional strategy what is the long-term ambition um you know exactly, up yeah. to 2050 and what's a, a viable pipeline to to enable that to happen so that things you know flow and, and don't get sort of um get get sort of choked up i'm just going to jump to a couple of questions that we've got um there's one on the insurance market and what do we think the insurance market will mandate the need for redundancy and mooring lines in large commercial projects <clears throat> any thoughts on that guy sorry what was the question when do we think no sorry um do you believe the insurance market will mandate the need for redundancy in mooring lines, um, I really don't. I really don't know the answer to that. We um, we actually have a big consultation with one of our brokers next month on this. But I, th- I think again, from a, an LCOE project valuation perspective, mooring redundancy makes drives a huge amount of cost. So I'd hope the answer will be no. Okay. I think maybe our base case is, all, is almost assuming that it will be no. <clears throat> yeah. We have got a, um, a session this afternoon on moorings and anchoring, so maybe yeah. uh, the presenter then can um, shed some light on that. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier, the Floating Offshore Wind Centre of Excellence, and I know that they're doing some work looking at the insurance market as well for floating offshore wind. So maybe there'd be some answers that come out of that. Um, another question came in. You mentioned about a throughput ambition for one structure per week. Yeah. Um, what 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 did that mean? Was that the whole floating um, platform? No, that, the, the, so yeah, that's, so the and I sh- the substructure, floating substructure, manufacturing, you know, fully right. completion. So so if you take the example of somewhere like ABP um, or Milford Haven, you know, the big ports in um, so uh, Pembroke Dock, you know, big ports for the Kel- and I'm quite, I guess I'm quite Celtic Sea orientated here. Um, those kind of ports, then <clears throat> those ports can provide in the in the short term. The final assembly of of finished components and uh you know big pieces for foundations but they need to be assembled and validated and signed off within you know a, a week that 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 one one a week has kind of come from once a fortnight over the last six months i found and it is hugely ambitious but again if you look through to the you know the time between if your capex spend through to when you can get connected offshore and you can start claiming your cfd you know it's that period which is you know we absolutely have to minimize Right. OK. Um, another one that's come in. I'm not sure I quite understand this. Are RWE looking at vertical access, multi-purpose floating platforms? So I suppose they mean vertical access um, um, turbines. Are you looking at traditional horizontal access, three bladed? Y- yes, we are. Yeah. Um, looking at vertical access, multi-floating platforms. Uh, so I'm not sure about multi-purpose through kind of ha- having like wave devices on the platforms. I'm not sure if that was also, and I would say we would look at anything and uh, we would always look at everything. I think um, when we get to the final or closer towards the technology selection stage, um, you know, it's hard to depart too far from the majors in the, in the, in the turbine um, kind of OEM world because of, because of the capex involved here, but we, we would look at every, other things. So if, if anybody has anything they'd like to set up a call with either floating foundation or turbine experts, I can absolutely arrange that. Okay, brilliant. A uh, question from Alan. Um, you mentioned temporary solutions for ports. Can you expand yeah. on what you see those solutions as being, or what are you looking for? Yeah, I think it's um, it's the 
it's temporary solutions to backfill the amount of space that we need. You know, can we start to use jackups? If we get a 400 megawatt project in the Celtic Sea, well, to, to sustain that, that throughput, how do we do it with limited key space? So looking at other infrastructure um, floating, you know, I, I guess it's going to be jackups versus versus much else. Are you responding there? Um, yeah, other infrastructure we can use to ensure that that speed that that uh, that that speed of throughput. Yeah, jack up, jack up orientated. Um, and one from um, uh, Lucas. Um, what do you think is the largest bottleneck for new port infrastructure? Uh, is it the cost? Is it the environmental impacts for, for dredging and things like that, uh, or is it around planning the amount of time they need to actually? implement infrastructure change i think it's probably the first one there of the cost yeah uh, but this at the same time then it, it's the actual it's the physical construction of the of the work you know and this this is a problem we have you know we can't really commit to a port until probably 24 months before our rfid and and that's no good when, when the port needs to do five or seven years worth of, of infrastructure development um so it's the cost but i think you know once the money's there it's understood i'm sure the ports can they will have better uh, control of their construction timelines okay smashing um i just want to bring our other um speakers back in now um <clears throat> if i can get my screen to work can you see my slide any questions related to session one or do i need to swap them over no that's fine is that working correct is it yeah <clears throat> um so just for all our speakers and thanks very much for the presentations there um did we I, I suppose we could wrongly give the impression that we're working in silos here we're looking at blades we're looking separately at towers our our industry representative is saying crikey look there's there's lots of challenges out here you know help me help me do you think we're doing enough um, across all the different component parts to actually provide a, um, a joined up integrated view of what needs to be done? A sort of open question to, to any of our panelists there. <clears throat> I mean, Dylan, you know, in, in terms of um, you're looking at towers, you know, how much work do you do integrating with um, different platform designs and things like that? Yeah, it's. Uh... I think the towers, probably more so than any other component, are very much better defined than any other component. So like, for example, I'll be doing a presentation this afternoon on the floating structure and the floating structure, there is no baseline industry standard component. Uh, so with the tower, you've got probably, I want to say, uh, it's in a weird position almost in that sense, in terms of how do you want to take the risk and look at something new or do you want to kind of look at what else we can cover first and then build the, a new tower around that potentially <coughs> so there's the approach there is potentially quite interesting uh but it's a it's in a weird kind of unique position when compared to the other components i'd say yeah and then um guy mentioned about there only being two cranes suitable for um <clears throat> turbine integration at 50 megawatts um mark is that something that we sort of think about or do you think about when you're looking at different blade designs sorry, i missed the first part simon could you repeat sorry um guy said that there are only two cranes available in the world for heavy lift for 50 megawatt turbine yeah. so looking yeah. at that <clears throat> turbine integration challenge and is that something that you sort of in, is in the back of your mind when you're looking at future blade design and, and you're looking at sort of segmented designs? Well, well, certainly it feeds into the segmented story and maybe yeah. having um, key side assembly, but you still, you have to assemble the walls. You still need the, the, the crane, crane, a crane lift capacity of some sort, even if you did like pre-assembled um, um, rotors rotor assemblage, but but segmentation certainly would ease the individual lift per, per blade. Um, generally, it's not a, I wouldn't say in, in blade design, it's it's a key driver because mass minimization is always de rigueur when it comes to, to blade design. So for a given length, you, we always want to minimize 
massive blade per se, but segmentation is certainly an area that would would ease that constraint. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, for some reason, I can't see any more questions from the audience. from the delegates okay uh, I, Simon, Simon, no i found them now <laughs> I, mean, to, but to, I mean to answer your question around industry collaboration certainly the carbon trust joint industry project like i said is my final slide around trying to tackle these industry scale problems i think is a very kind of open and transparent um initiative that's that's operating very well um and and I've, you, know, you mentioned towers, and I think tower production is is really where, from a steel semi sub perspective for floating foundations, it's the towers that we really need to to use and to be able to mimic and use those production lines, those kind of forensic, you know, high speed production lines to be able to to to, to produce these towers that can then you know be used for for um for floating foundations uh, and some of the smaller stuff. And yeah, I I, I appreciate I listed lots of the the little the smaller bits but in comparison of your overall capex those smaller bits even though they're going to be it's a 20 ton anchor from a cost perspective um there's risk there but it's much much less than it is in these high value items such as the tower such as the turbine such as the foundation yeah no it it, it also starts to add up at the uh, at the end of the day doesn't it um <clears throat> guy there's a couple of questions there i think we've covered them um in our in our sort of live chat, if you just want to sort of type in an answer just to um, clarify our responses, oh, I see. Really great. Yep, sure. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so I think that's all the questions related to session one. Um, just for your information, uh, David, um, what's coming in the future, sort of future events. Um, if you look there, we've, we've got something on um, data for floating offshore wind coming in April. Um, we've got a specific event probably looking at concrete for floating offshore wind, uh, concrete foundations. Um, then another event in June on composites, um, the primary, um, which is an academic event, um, is on the 8th of July. There'll be a showcase piece there. Um, and then more to follow on anchoring and mooring. Um, so in September, um, and these are ones that are set at the moment. Um, in addition to that, there'll be um, the deep dives that we've promised that will um, we we'll form those as a result of the feedback that we get from this morning's session. Um, and then this afternoon session, um, we've got um, more on um, uh, moorings and anchorings, as I say. And uh, Dylan's coming back to talk about uh, foundations as well. And then we've got uh, Ollie Strobe from BW IDL to talk about the um, uh, industry perspective from their perspective and looking in particular at concrete whole found, uh, foundation. So you can stick on the same link. Um, we're going to stop in a minute for lunch and we'll be starting to broadcast again um, at two o'clock. Um, if you're not coming back this afternoon, um, I just want to say special thanks to all our speakers this morning. It's been fantastic presentations, lots and lots of detail in there. Um, those people sitting in the background who made this all happen, Julie Taylor, who organised the event, Vicky, who's been making sure that Zoom behaved itself, and Phil Johnson from um, Chaotic Sea Power, and Neil Farrington from Chaotic Sea Power, who's helped to um, organise the event and reach out to some of you as delegates. So, um, as I said, session two is going to commence at um, two o'clock. Use the same Zoom link. Um, you can keep forward in sort of questions as we go. Um, and in the meantime, grab yourself some lunch, have a refresh, and uh, we'll see you at two o'clock. So thanks very much, presenters. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye -bye.